apologize. I'm a little bit late for Weight Loss Wednesday. My plane coming in from Detroit, Michigan, where I had the honor of speaking twice at the Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group, was delayed. It was nine degrees there today, so I'm very happy to be back in California. And we were just about ready to go at three o'clock, as I had announced, but Kenny said I had to change because I was wearing a sweatsuit. So anyway, we're here. Anybody on, Kenny? We always want to make sure we have sound, one person. You guys know the drill. One person, one person only say you can hear me. It's interesting because sometimes you guys say you can't hear me, but other people say they can hear me. And we've always been able we to We got nine, but replay. they can hear you. No one said anything. Great. But don't, All right. Let's I'm not going to worry about it. All righty then. So welcome to episode 13 of Weight Loss Wednesday. I'm Chef AJ, the creator of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, and this is where I answer your questions about healthy, permanent, and sustainable weight loss. The best way to submit a question is through our email list. So if you just go to www.eatunprocessed.com, it goes to my husband Charles and then he prints it out for me to answer your questions. And while you're there, just click the little blue box, you get a recipe and you'll be on my list because I'm sending out really wonderful weekly videos now. I just did one this week with Dr. Doug Lyle on whether or not we should weigh or measure our food. It's getting a lot of great hits and activity. Why are you holding your eyes, Kenny? Kenny's going like this. I don't know what his uh, lingo means, but anyway, glad to have him back. So the first question from Erin is that she found out she's extremely anemic and what are her recommendations for female with anemia? So first of all, I'm not a doctor. So even if I thought I knew, I can't make any medical recommendations other than to tell you that I think you should actually see a doctor because even if I were to recommend what foods are high in iron, which I could certainly do or you could just Google, you need to find out what is causing your anemia. So I, if you don't have a plant-based doctor, I'd be happy to help you find one in your area. There's a great website www.vegdocs.com and you can put in your zip code. The doctors at True North, those are the doctors I see, the wonderful medical doctors like Dr. Clapper and Sultana and Lim, they do consults via phone or Skype and they're wonderful plant-based doctors. And of course, Dr. Ellen Goldhammer will do a free 20-minute phone consult if you fill out the intake form at www.healthpromoting.com. But definitely please, you know, see a healthcare professional and figure out what this is, all right? So thank you. So the next question is somewhat medical, but I think I actually can't answer this because it's, it's, it's food related mostly. So Diane said that she's concerned about her calcium intake and she says she's in her mid 50s and recently fractured my ribs. I'm sorry to hear that because that's happened to me and I know it's really painful. Oh, not her ribs, her tibia. AJ needs glasses. I'm sure that's even more painful or just as painful. She's worried about the strength of her bones and she has added calcium fortified soy milk to her diet. But last week's Weight Loss Wednesday, I said it was not a good strategy for weight loss. Would there be other calcium fortified plant based milks that would be better like almond milk? If not, how do I add more calcium to my diet and still lose weight? So I recommend a book by Dr. Amy Lanou. She used to be with PCRM and it's called Building Bone Vitality and it's a wonderful book. You don't have to have any fortified products to get enough calcium. You need to eat more greens greens, bok choy, kale, all the dark leafy greens that Dr. Esselstyn talks about, this is where all the calcium is. You don't need dairy for sure, and you don't even need plant-based milk to get calcium with a fortified product. You just need to eat way more greens. And that's what I would recommend. And then also weight-bearing exercise. That's what you need to do for your bones. Are you doing a lot of weight-bearing exercise? You can get a, a weighted vest. So there's so many things you could do, but the main thing is to eat more vegetables, especially greens every day. You know, Dr. Esselstyn recommends his patients eat greens six times a day and to do some type of weight bearing exercise like wearing a weighted vest to build bone vitality. So that's what I recommend. And I, I don't know if I said that drinking soy milk wasn't a good weight loss strategy. I just say that not liquids are just not a good weight loss strategy. There's no satiety in liquids. So I don't recommend and really we drink anything but water, maybe some pot liquor, which is the delicious broth left over from our steamed vegetables or some herbal teas when it's cold, like nine degrees in Detroit. The plant milks really are supposed to be condiments. We're not supposed to really be drinking them. So, you know, they're used to maybe splash on your oatmeal or, or in a recipe, things like that. We don't want to be just drinking them. And getting off dairy is the most important thing anyone can do for their human health. And so whatever plant-based milk is gonna get you off dairy, I recommend, but if you're following the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, you know, we don't do sugar, we don't do oil, we don't do salt, which means that except for soy milk, all the boxed plant milks have at least salt. That's why I teach you in so many of my episodes of 
the chef and the dietitian, and on my television show, Healthy Living with Chef AJ, how do you make plant milks easily just by using things like whole oats, brown rice, or just a couple of tablespoons of almond butter. So that's what I recommend doing. They taste better, they're cheaper, they don't have all that stuff in them. I was just, as I said, in Detroit, and one of the doctors was saying that carrageenan, which is often the additive in, additive in many of these plant milks, is really bad for our health. And so the thing that's great about soy milk is that if you buy certain brands, it's the cleanest milk because it's just soybeans or water. Some people actually make it in their home. But for weight loss, even though soybeans are a legume, they're over 50% fat, I believe 56% fat. So it's much higher in fat and calories than the other plant milks. Coconut would also be high in fat and calories. So don't look for supplements or, or fortified foods to meet your nutritional needs. Eat the actual whole food. So you gotta be eating more greens and you gotta be moving your body, especially during doing weight bearing ep episodes. Exercise, sorry, I'm tired. I'm done. I am on a very weird schedule right now. So alrighty. Okie doke, so Kirsten from Seattle says she saw me in Portland with her two daughters. I remember them very well. A bunch of beautiful blondes in your family, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. She said it was the highlight of her year, so thank you. I appreciate that. So she says, what do I think of pearl barley versus bulgur? I know barley is high in fiber. Just wondering if you would recommend barley as a grain substitute. Well, barley is a grain. It's a glutinous grain and it's a whole grain. So I don't know what you mean by saying would I recommend it as a substitute because it is a whole grain. So are you thinking of like to eat it like as oatmeal or put it in soup or, or you know, to make like a bean type burger? If you could be more specific, I could perhaps address that if you're asking from a culinary standpoint. But if you are in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program or suffer from food addictions, I don't recommend gluten at all. I don't recommend it anyway. And I'm gonna be interest, interviewing a very well-known gastrointestinal doctor very soon about this subject, but until then, I just go with what Dr. Goldhammer says and follow a gluten-free diet because he talks about the link between gluten and specifically Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. And if you wanna hear that interview, you go to my other website, which is Healthy Taste Online, and Dr. Goldhammer talks about that specifically. But from a food addiction standpoint, I did other interviews with health professionals, Dr. Erwin Linsner and Dr. Joan Iflin, and those interviews are on that website as well, where they talked about not eating gluten, at least glutinous grains, which are barley, rye, wheat, spelt, trichotale, and I believe couscous. Almost all the other grains are gluten-free, so things like teff, millet, amaranth, quinoa, buckwheat, wild rice, oats, all the different colors of rice, red and black and brown. There's plenty of grains without gluten, but they say to avoid the glutinous grains because when we ingest them, they turn to these compounds called gluteomorphine in the brain. Morphine being like an opiate, and so there are these feel-good chemicals. And so for people that are food addicted, they're not a good thing to indulge in, even in the whole food form. Now, I always recommend eating things in their whole food form, you know, food from a plant instead of food that was manufactured in a plant, as close to nature as possible, unrefined and less processed, especially for weight loss, because the more food is processed, the worse it is for weight loss, the less it's processed, the better it is for weight loss. So I would suggest if you suffer from any of those things that to avoid gluten entirely. You can also do this, you know, a lot of the tests for celiacs are not as sensitive as others. There's some new tests being developed every day. A lot of people have what's called non-celiac gluten intolerance, but the proof of the pudding I believe is in the eating and to see if you're somebody that should avoid gluten, let's say you're not a food addict and aren't avoiding it for that reason, the gluteomorphine, which is similar to the casomorphine, you know, when we ingest dairy, the, the dairy protein casein turns to the casomorphine in our brain, the opiate, the feel-good chemical. Great book coming out next month on this very topic by Neil Barnard called The Cheese Trap. But what a good test is to do, especially if you don't wanna to go to the doctor and get the blood tests or the stool tests for gluten intolerance, is you can go like a month without it. Everybody can do things for a month. And then afterwards, just eat some and then see how you feel. And if you feel great, then maybe you wanna include it. And if you don't, maybe you don't wanna include it. All right, thank you, uh, Kirsten, for that question. Okay, so Colleen wants to know if when I batch cook for the week, am I freezing any food? So the answer is yes, mainly because I go out of town so much, almost every week somewhere to speak that I want my husband Charles to have food. And so usually what I'll do is for instance, when I make a recipe in the Instant Pot, whether it's red lentil chili or black bean mushroom chili, these recipes are they're on my website now or in one of the webinars, or my new favorite, the creamy curry kabocha squash soup or the smoky butternut bisque. 
Instant Pot recipes generally make about 16 cups, 16 to 18 cups, and we usually eat per meal. You know, I don't, I don't like to weigh and measure, but you guys always ask about that. So we eat about two cups each and over two cups of brown rice. And so that would be about eight servings, eight or nine, depending. And so what I like to do is usually right off the bat freeze like four cups, which would be like two servings, so that when I come home like today late and there's dinner, I can pull out a carton or a bag and we can have dinner or I'll just freeze it in a two cup Ziploc bag so that he can just pull it out for lunch. So I definitely freeze that actually, if I wasn't, my kitchen wasn't over there I would show you the best way to freeze soup and if Kenny will stand in for me because you guys got to see how cute he is I can show you how I freeze my soup I do it in Ziploc bags because glass can break and it takes up too much room in the freezer but if you take a one gallon freezer Ziploc bag and put it over a pitcher and then ladle it in it, it freezes completely flat and you can write on the white part you know what it is in the date so I'll definitely freeze that um, beans definitely freeze those when I cook them and definitely grains especially rice especially the brown Texamati rice which I love and you know I also do buy pre-made stuff so Costco has an organic brown rice in four cup bags and I always make sure I have that or the two cup ones from Trader Joe's but I do freeze when I batch cook the only thing I have not frozen well, I shouldn't say I haven't frozen. I haven't eaten it regular, meaning the potatoes. So when I cook, batch cook sweet potatoes or potatoes, the only time I've frozen them is if I'm gonna make the blueberry mill oat muffins and I know I need a certain amount of cups of the flesh and I will freeze that for that recipe, but I've never actually like frozen a roasted or steamed sweet potato or potato and then took it out to eat it. Myself. Just using that word flesh in the same flesh. conversation <laughs> sounds a little creepy. Anybody, any, anybody got any questions, Kenny? I've got a few more here. Well, yeah. Janice says she loves your sweater, and I'm oh, glad you um, changed it. Thanks. I got it at Macy's. Uh, actually, about four years ago at Macy's in Santa Rosa when I was in True North because it was so cold. The, the we fountain have froze. people from Sarasota, Florida to Vancouver, Washington, oh, Washington. and it's snowing in Salem, Oregon. Wow. I mean, what is that like? We're so snow. happy to be back in California, let me tell you. Golly. Nine degrees. I don't know how you guys do it in other climates. Yeah, it's really cold here. It's like 65 out here. I know, it's like 65, 65 today, but I'm never going to complain about 65 again. After after nine degrees okay. in Detroit today. So Kristen wants to know, and this is a question for her friends that saw the movie Eating You Alive, which if you haven't seen, I have one line in it, so don't close your eyes or, or sneeze, you might miss it. We me. got one question for another person when you're done. I'll, I'll just, okay. Uh, I, we'll just ask it now, I'll come back to yeah. Kristen's question, sure. I, w I was, you know, she, this is kind of a little heavy, oh. but uh, glucose, well, this lady, um, Shirley, her, mm -hmm. she says, when you eat glucose, and, and your glucose dips down to 60s and 70s. What do you eat? Well, again, that's a medical question. I'm not a doctor, but yeah. when your blood sugar's low, you eat food. I mean, you Just certainly don't eat. eat sugar. You know, I mean, what, what eat a sweet potato or a piece Just, of fruit. Yeah. You know, I'm, I mean, eat food. When you're hungry and you don't know what to eat, eat an apple. Eat. Well, my, my, my phrase that I use with the Ultimate Weight Loss Participants is if you're not hungry enough to eat vegetables, you're not hungry. But if you are diabetic or pre-diabetic, you know, you, you want to eat what your doctor tells you to eat. I don't think you ever necessarily have to eat sugar. I mean, I know when my grandmother was diabetic, um, she would have orange juice if she was true having a, you know, what is it called, what the diabetic... I think I'm so tired. I'm so sorry. The word where she, but but 67. That is that even low blood sugar? I mean, it's lower. 80 to 120, I believe, is what normal blood sugar is, or 80 to 100. But you know, if you're following a whole food plant based diet without oil and sweeteners, you know, hopefully you'll be able to regulate your blood sugar long term. And if you're not, you know, definitely see a medical doctor about that so that you can get that under control. You know, eat eat fairly regular meals. You know, if that's an issue, but I believe it was Dr. Goldhammer said there's really no such thing as hypoglycemia if you're following this way of eating, you know, and eating enough food and eating enough calories and eating enough starch. Yeah, there's one lady that saw you yesterday in, in Detroit, so she oh, says hello. Hello, lady. I'm looking from for her yesterday. again. What's your name? I'll tell you in just right. a second. Yeah, it, this feed goes really fast, guys. So I'm going to go back to so Kristen's fast. question. Eating You Alive is a film that some of her friends saw. It's a great film if you haven't seen it, and lots of wonderful plant based experts are in it. And they want to switch to a more wholesome, less processed vegan diet. And they wanted to know are the, which sweeteners are best. I get this question a lot. And I think I've answered it before, Definitely. but I'm happy to answer it again. And I will use the words of my mentor, Dr. Ellen Goldhammer, that just because something is less bad doesn't mean it's good. And it, when it comes to sugar and oil and salt, in my opinion, the best amount is none. And sugar is sugar, oil is oil, salt is salt. And we can sit here all day arguing which one of these things are better, but 
they're still not health promoting. We could argue if methamphetamines is less bad than cocaine and if cocaine is less bad than heroin, but why bother doing that? The thing is, is you wanna live and eat in a manner that's health promoting and sugar just isn't, guys. You wanna eat the fruit, the whole fruit and nothing but the whole fruit. And if it wasn't an addiction or at least an addiction for you, why would you be bargaining? Because that's, that's what addicts do to try to eat the healthiest kind. So, you know, you could argue that, oh, coconut sugar or molasses has some minerals, and but that's not why we eat sugar to get our minerals. That's what green vegetables are for. The USDA, the American Cancer Society, and the American Heart Association says that we do not need any of our calories. We do not need a single calorie from processed or refined sugar. We don't. And that if we decide to include them in our diet, they should be no more than 5% of our total calories, which means if you're somebody that, like, at my weight right now, if I wasn't, exercising, you'd be like 1,200 calories a day. So 5% of 1,200 is 60, I believe, if I did my math right. And sugar is 16 calories a, a teaspoon, no matter what kind it is. So that would be four teaspoons of sugar a day that I would be allowed, according to our governmental agencies, in discretionary calories. What the heck are you gonna eat or make with four teaspoons of sugar? Now, as a pastry chef for years, and it doesn't matter if it's vegan or raw or gluten-free, all desserts start with like a couple of cups of sugar. So if you're eating, a dessert, if you're drinking one soft drink, soft drink has, has anywhere from three to six times as much sugar as what is allowed by our, our government. I mean, no, I don't know anybody that really eats four teaspoons of sugar a day that eats sugar because the statistics show that Americans eat over 150 pounds of sugar per person per year, which means that most people are eating 900 calories from sugar. When if, Kenny, can you divide 900 by 16? Uh, Somebody could do that right now and tell me, and that's that's a, a lot. That's way more than four teaspoons. So we're gonna figure out how many teaspoons most Americans are eating a day. And if you're supposed to eat four at my weight, or maybe let's say six, if you're a higher weight than me, two tablespoons a day. That's 56. 56, so they need 56 times as much. So here's the thing. So what they say is it's not so much the type of sugar that matters in your diet, it's the amount. So if you're gung-ho on not you know, giving up processed sugars, then what you want to do is pick the one that you'll eat the least amount of. Now, there's certain ones that I think are completely unfavorable, like high fructose corn syrup and agave. Agave is actually higher in fructose than even high fructose corn syrup, and it's metabolized in the liver. So you can you can Google agave, the high fructose fraud. A lot of people think because it's raw, it's health, more health promoting, and the rawness does not have anything to do with it. It's not. It's still a highly processed sweetener. My litmus test is: if, can you make it in your own kitchen? Now, I can make date paste in my own kitchen. I can take dates and soak them in water using page, the recipe on page 60 of Unprocessed. I can make date paste. Dates are a whole natural food. They're found in nature. They contain water, fiber, vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, antioxidants, and micronutrients, but all the processed sugars really don't contain any of these. And when you process a food, you make it calorie rich and nutrient poor. It takes three feet, which is about this much of sugar cane, just to make one teaspoon of sugar. And how many people would be able to eat that much sugar cane? Probably nobody. It would take a really, really, really long time to do that. So, you know, honey is one choice, but that's not vegan. It's bee vomit, and in nature, you couldn't have gotten honey. I mean, we need special people in these suits so that they don't get stung to take the honey from the bees. The bees didn't make it from us. The bees didn't make honey for us any more than the cow makes milk for us. It's for their young, it's for them. So that's the thing with honey, because people say, oh, well, if it's locally sourced, you know, sugar is sugar. You can keep deluding yourself that it's healthier because of some great marketing thing, just like people delude themselves into thinking coconut oil is healthy, you know, the miracle coconut oil cure. And in the film, Eating You Alive, Dr. Evan Allen from Las Vegas said the only miracle is that it's still being sold, coconut oil. But sugar is sugar, guys. If you want to eat it, eat it. I mean, it's not, the Ultimate Weight Loss Program is not a court appointed program, but it is not health promoting in any way, shape or form. And when you stop eating it, you can learn to satisfy your sweet tooth just with whole natural fruit and fruit actually becomes amazing and delicious. Now, if you suffer from refined food addiction, and we've talked in many episodes about how you know if you do, you kind of know because you can't stop eating it, things like sugar, flour, bread, and pasta, or drinking alcohol, you might want to include none of these because if you are truly an addict, and again, this exists on a continuum, it's some people being more vulnerable than others and people varying in their vulnerability depending on what's going on in their life, the only thing that I have ever known to work for an addiction is abstinence. Moderation does not work, moderation kills. If moderation worked, we wouldn't have over three-fourths of our Americans overweight and more than half of them obese. 
One out of every three people, including children now, are obese. They're the fastest growing population segment of our population right now. So, you know, uh, if you listen to my weekly webinar series with Dr. Pam Peek, who spoke at the McDougal Advanced Study Weekend, she talked about how in brain scans and MRIs, they show that sugar is more addictive than heroin. So would you then be saying, well, what kind of heroin should I take, you know, or how much? No, just get rid of it. And, you know, I know that some people need to transition, but I'll tell you, a lot of people just never do by including even small amounts of these things. So, you know, I would say the best amount of sweetener is none and use fruit. And in my book on process, there's 40 dessert recipes and none of them use processed sugar. They use dates and, you know, you'll get used to it. You will neuroadapt once you stop eating so much sugar, but it's hidden in everything. You know, they put sugar in everything from baby formula to geriatric formula. It's even put in cigarettes. So if you're eating processed food at all, it's going to be really hard to get away from it. One lady's asking, Silam, it's made out of dates. Is that okay? Could you spell it, please? S-I-L-A-N. I guess it's maybe a processed form of dates? I don't know. I've never heard of that. The I'm whole sorry. fruit, not the... Not it, the you know, um, I mean, whole dates are great. I don't know what Silam is. I'm sorry, I can look it up when I'm done. And maybe that's a brand, brand name. You know, I think date syrup, which I can make in my kitchen, is still too concentrated for most people, even though it's technically a whole food, and date sugar. We've removed the water. You can make date sugar in your own house. You just take dates and put them in the dehydrator and grind them. And I think that is a little bit too processed too because we've taken the water out and in date syrup, we've boiled it and, and reduced it and it, it's still, you know, sugar-like. And, you know, I think there, there can be a use for these date sweetened desserts. I know for me, it helped because I ate nothing but sugar and flour for the first 43 years of my life. And there wasn't an ultimate weight loss program then for me to join. And so I use dates as a transition food, sort of like methadone but they're too sweet for me now. I can't eat them at all. They're just way too sweet. They are 70% sugar, but because they're bound with the fiber and the vitamins and minerals, at least according to Dr. Greger at nutritionfacts.org, they're still a more favorable sweetener. So, you know, I wanted to mention something because it's actually a question from Marcus and it's about the fake sugars. And he asked, well, why can't he have stevia? And you can have whatever you want because it's not a court ordered program. But my recommendation is if your goal is health, weight loss or to reverse food addiction, you don't use the fake sugars. And I know some of you might be thinking, well, stevia is not fake, it's found in nature. And that's true if you eat the green leaf. But I know very few people that are using stevia in the whole leaf form. What they're using is the powdered form or the liquid form with the little drops that come in different flavors like chocolate and raspberry. And I see these women carrying it in their purse and oh, their pocket no. and putting it and they can't even drink water without it. And we've had members of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, you guys know who you are, Sweet Potato, that's her mm. nickname, I don't wanna say her name, <laughs> that, that were completely addicted uh, to stevia even, even if they were slender. <clears throat> you know, when you process these fake sugars or zero calorie sweeteners, it goes through the same refining process as drugs and alcohol as does regular sugar and flour. But here's the problem, guys, with using things like stevia, erythritol, xylitol, sorbitol, mannitol, anything that ends in OL, these sugar alcohols. Well, first of all, uh, Dr. Esselstyn, the last time I heard him speak, which is the Engine 2 conference in October in Dallas, said no to all of these things. He said they completely injure your endothelial cells, which are the life jacket of your circulatory system, which in the past I've only heard him refer to oil as doing that. But he said no, all these fake and zero calorie sweeteners injure this as well. When I heard Robin Chutkin, the author of Gut Bliss, the well-known gastroenterologist, speak at the Plantrition Conference, she said these things are horrible, the stevia and the erythritol for our microbiome, which I'm going to be interviewing, I said recently, an expert on that, which is why you hopefully are signed up for my website at eatonprocess.com so you can see that interview. But here's the other thing. When you eat these zero calorie sweeteners, you actually perpetuate your desire to eat more sweet because you're not getting a calorie reward because stevia, erythritol, and xylitol, they have no calories. You know, we have taste buds on the tip of our tongue for sweet and salt. And so when we taste something sweet, and by the way, stevia is so many times sweeter than anything found in nature, and so are these fake sugars. Uh, I believe erythritol is made from corn, and so many people have GI distress from that. But they taste sweet, and so our brain thinks, oh boy, yay, 
there's going to be some food coming. There's going to be calories. Well, there's no calories in this. And so your brain goes like, what up, what up? And it sends out these hormones that make you hungrier. So you end up eating more, which is why have you noticed that most people that drink diet soda are generally heavier than people that drink regular soda. Not that I'm recommending that you drink regular soda because it's all poison. But if somebody had a gun to my head, I would drink a regular soda before definitely drinking the diet soda because that's addictive in so many ways, not just the caffeine. Uh, you know, if you go on the medical literature, like if you go to Medscape or PubMed or the Journal of American, Journal, um, JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association, they talk about how these fake sugars, at least aspartame, are linked to stroke and memory loss. So it's not good. You know, we need to eat whole natural food, unprocessed from a plant, not made in the plant. And eat the fruit, the whole fruit, nothing but the whole fruit, and then you will enjoy it. So. Yes, I don't want to stroke. I have to let you know, Jill is watching you live. Nice. On a treadmill. Well, working. good, good. I wish, you know, we got to get a treadmill. I got to start doing Well, I've been trying to move around a little bit. I'll start you're doing trying to make you laugh, treadmill. but that okay. didn't work out well. But I have a question. There's sure. a lady um, who's, who saw this movie last night with you, Jane Walsh. Uh -huh. And she was like, uh, Joan Efflan's Joan advice uh -huh. goes against this. I was confused. Uh -huh. No measurement, no measuring. Well, I guess she's in the measuring yeah. zone. Well, uh, if you're, listen, I'm not going to ever bash my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Joan Ifland. And if you are in her program doing strict weighing and measuring and it works for you, please keep doing it. Please keep doing it. But as I said in the video that I did with Dr. Doug Lyle called, do we need, I think we called it weighing and measuring. Do we really need to do it? We sent it out last night to our mailing list. You can find it on YouTube. I get at least a hundred emails a day inquiring about the ultimate weight loss program and at least 10 of them are from people that have done these programs and failed miserably. And that's why I decided to interview an expert on it, and I'll actually be interviewing Dr. Goldhammer on Saturday on the same subject. So if it works for you, keep doing it. But if you are following the McDougall Program for Maximum Weight Loss or the Health Promoting Diet Taught at True North for the last 30 years or the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, these are all the same diet style. It's a whole food plant-based diet, starch-based, without sugar, oil, salt, gluten, or yeah, sugar, or alcohol, <laughs> you are going to uh, starve if you weigh and measure your food because I believe those food plans are four ounces of protein, six ounces of a starch, and seven ounces of vegetables. That's 13, 17 ounces of food per meal. If you do that with the calorically dilute, low density foods that we recommend on the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, you're gonna be starving. And so, again, I love Dr. Rifflin, and if her program is working for you, please keep doing it. We are we agree on many, many things, but my understanding is on her program and on most of these food addiction programs, you are required to have at least two tablespoons to three tablespoons of oil a day, and we don't do that mm -hmm. on any of the plant-based programs. These are all oil-free, and when you're getting that much fat and calories from oils, that, I mean, for the amount of oil that they're getting on these programs, I could be eating a pound of roasted sweet potatoes for that same amount of calories without the fat, so I do. So um, I'm guessing that individual is not in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program no. because we don't weigh and measure our food for ourselves, and yet we have people that have lost over 100 pounds, even over 200 pounds. We have a couple of people who have come back and following up from the, sure. from the Ceylon subject. Yeah, sure. Ceylon is a Middle Eastern date honey. Oh. According. So it's just date honey. Well, well, wait a minute. But date honey, but here's the problem. You need to shoot me a label, shoot the picture, and, and tag it on What's this in it? post. What because, else is there? Because I'm going to tell you that a lot of date, the fact that it's called honey, a lot of times these date syrups that I have seen in the Middle Eastern oh. markets have sugar added. So please send me a photo of the label and I will tell you what I think. But again, I think it's too concentrated. I, I mean, for somebody that's suffering from food addiction, I don't even recommend dates. I really don't. I know that in my recipes, there's a couple of savory recipes that use like three dates in the yummy sauce. I created these recipes before I realized I suffer from food addiction or food addiction even existed. And I would write these recipes differently today. And when I, my new book comes out, there's going to be a note about that, that if you're making it for family members, put it in. And if you're making it for yourself, if you're trying to lose weight or suffer from food addiction, don't. Realize that even though dates are a whole natural food, a dried fruit like dates or raisins, they're 1,300 calories a pound and the water has been removed. Whole fruit is 200 calories a pound. It's more than six times as calorically dense. And if you're trying to be satiated, if you're trying to be full, you want everything you eat to have water and fiber. So dried fruits has the water removed. That's why the caloric density is so high. So no, I don't even really, oh, sorry, gonna fall on my screen. I don't recommend dates anymore for, for people that are overweight or suffering with food addiction. But 
that said, if they're going to say, well, if I don't have dates and I'm going to eat sugar, then I would much rather see people eat dates than the real sugar or the fake sugar or the sugar analogs. Okay, I've got a couple more questions. So Amber says, people ask how to determine if they're hungry, and you answer, if you're not hungry enough to eat vegetables, then you're probably not hungry. But then you also mentioned that you need vegetables and starch to create satiety. I know you don't do portion control, but do, do should. Do, you, do people generally eat their salad until they no longer want it, veggies until they no longer want it, and finally end with starch until they're satisfied? How do, you determine, how do you determine how many vegetables are enough before you allow yourself to eat starch? Eating in that order, salad, non-starchy vegetable starch, really does work for me. Since I eat a ton of vegetables, sometimes to the point of just forcing it in, and then it leaves little room for starches. But sometimes I'll still eat starch even though I'm no longer hungry because of filling up on vegetables. I hope this makes sense. Well, it sort of does. And I actually asked Dr. Goldhammer this question, and he answered it. And I'm going to tell you what his answer is, and that's why I'm also going to be interviewing him on this. So. I don't know, I'm sorry that if you're a member of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, that would help me because a lot of this stuff we go into great detail with. I'm happy to kind of cover it briefly here. So the idea is that for people that are overweight and trying to lose weight, one of the strategies, and not everybody has to do this by the way, is to sequence your meals. And what that means is eat in order of increasing caloric density. Well, raw vegetables at 100 calories a pound are the food lowest in caloric density, followed by cooked vegetables or steamed vegetables where the water has been removed, which are about maybe foods that are to the left of the red line. And the research that has been done by Barbara Rolls and others shows that if you keep your average caloric density to 567 calories per pound or less, almost everyone can eat an, an ad libitum style as much as they want, as often as they want, whenever they want until comfortably full. But realize we're not adding any chemicals to our food like sugar, oil, salt, and flour, which fool the brain satiety mechanisms and cause people to overeat exponentially. So most people can just eat to the left of the red line and they don't have to worry about how much they're eating or, or, or what combination. Let me just show you a plate right here. You know, you can just, get this same thing at the PCRM power plate. This is one that I got at a restaurant called Sweet Tomatoes, but the idea is, is there's four segments in the plate. Now I don't recommend pasta, but the idea is, is a quarter of your plate is fruit, a quarter of your plate is non-starchy vegetables, a quarter is whole grains, and a quarter is what they call protein, which if you see here is beans. And so many people, if not most people, can just eat any combination of these foods and be full, satisfied, happy, lose weight, reverse their diseases. But there are people, and it seems to be those of us that suffer from the disease of refined food addiction, that do better when we sequence our meals because we can easily overeat on the starch and ignore the fruits and vegetables. And you will not be obese doing that, by the way, because when people come to the Ultimate Weight Loss Program or considering it and say, well, I hate vegetables, I'm not gonna eat vegetables, I'm not gonna eat fruit, I'm like, fine, just eat starch because you can do that and be pretty slim and pretty healthy. I think you're gonna be slimmer and healthier if you eat fruits and vegetables, but I would much rather have these people come to me that are eating the standard American diet or doing something crazy like, you know, the, the Zone or Atkins or Paleo or Nutrisystem and, and just learn to eat these kind of foods. And so, you know, if they won't eat fruits and vegetables, they'll eat, well, eat a potato, eat rice and beans, no problem. You know, don't add sugar, oil, flour, salt, or alcohol to your food, but that would be great. So what happens is they will lose weight doing that because they've lowered their caloric density. I don't know if they'll be as healthy as they can without the nutrients and the vitamins and the phytochemicals that are found really only in fruits and vegetables, or at least more prevalent there. But the idea is, is the sequencing of the meals helps you get full on fewer calories faster. So if you're familiar with my lecture, The Secrets to Ultimate Weight Loss, where I talk about that, we're filling up on um, fewer calories by following the principles of calorie density, which allow us to literally eat twice as much food and take in half as many calories, which is why if you're following this diet style, the weighing and measuring is not going to work because you're not going to get enough food, you're not going to get enough calories because the caloric density of these foods are too low because we're not eating nuts, we're not eating you know, oils, things like that that are 4,000 calories a pound, nuts which are 3,000 calories a pound. And so if you start with the lowest caloric density food first, which is salad, then you want to fill up on that. But, but Amber, you never want to eat to the point of just because it's there you have to finish it and stuff yourself. That, that, I don't think that's good. My goal for you is to really get in touch with your, with your body sensations and learn to eat when hungry and stop when full and stop eating for emotional reasons 
eating for hunger and survival, not eating for entertainment or boredom or stress or loneliness or anger or anxiety or depression, things like that. So finding that sweet spot of starch to vegetables, that's something that everybody's gonna have to do for themselves. And it's also gonna be based on your activity. See, one of the problems that I have with these weighing and measuring programs, at least the way they're described to me by my clients, I've never been in one, I've never weighed my food, I've never gone to a 12-step meeting, is that my understanding is it's a one size fits all. Everybody gets the same four ounces of protein, six ounces of starch or non-starchy vegetable, and seven ounces of salad, whether they're four foot 11 in a female or six foot four in a male, and they don't account for activity levels. What if you're running a marathon? You know, what if you're laying in bed? So that that is something right there to consider a reason that they may not work for you but if they do again please do them so yeah how do you stop eating for emotional reasons yeah so you get into a program like the ultimate weight loss program and you learn the tools that we give you and if you're already in there then you might want to try as an adjunct dr gould's program at shrinkyourself.com we interviewed him last week and you can still join our holiday webinar series to learn that or read his book shrink, Your shrink yourself i mean one way to stop eating for emotional reasons is to start journaling and every time you eat you know right I, i'm all for keeping a food journal i'm not for weighing and measuring your food i'm not for saying how much you ate but i'm i'm all for keeping a food journal that keeps you accountable and we can find out if you're not losing weight why and then also make it a food mood journal and you know ask yourself when you're eating this am I really hungry why do I want to eat this right now but that's like a whole nother question we could maybe address uh, last week because not last week next week because Kenny's going like this let me finish the sequencing question because so you start with the salad and then you know we have these stretch receptors in our stomach we have what's known as the mechanisms of satiation the stretch receptors nutrient receptors and calorie receptors and foods like oil and animal products and cheese and nuts their, their volume is low their calories are high they don't stretch out our stretch receptors but raw salad really does it gives us that nice little stretch so if we start there first we're filling up the tank and remember our stomach is about the size of a cantaloupe it holds about a liter of food so if you put in about about a pound of salad or raw vegetables you're going to start to get full but you're not gonna be satisfied yet. And so this is where the starch comes in and you need to eat as much as your caloric needs are. And you know, I don't wanna tell you a number because then I'm going to be a weighing and measuring program and I wanna be the alternative for the people that don't wanna do that for the rest of their life. But you will find that sweet spot. If you're struggling with those last few pounds, you can sequence the meals even more where you start with the raw salad and then you eat a large portion of steamed vegetables, preferably some of them are greens, and then you move on to the more concentrated starches. But you don't wanna stuff yourself with the fruits and vegetables so much that, that you don't have any room for the starches. I mean, there's nothing wrong with like waiting too. You know, nobody says you have, well, unless you're following one of these food uh, weighing and measuring programs where they require that you eat three days, three times a day at designated times with no snacks, we can learn to eat in tune with our body's natural hunger and rhythms just like our ancestors did. They didn't eat three meals a day. So you can certainly eat your salad or your steamed vegetables until you're full and then you don't eat until you're hungry again. So you don't have to feel like that you have to eat it all in one sitting. I mean, that's what I do when I get off my spin bike, I'm starving and I eat a couple of pounds of my roasted vegetables. And then maybe 20 minutes later, maybe two hours later, it depends, I'm hungry again and then I'll eat some starch with my vegetables. So you need to find that sweet spot for yourself, trial and error, because we're all different heights, we're all different ages, different metabolisms and different activity levels. But I don't recommend that you force the starch because you didn't get enough starch. I recommend that you wait until you're hungry again and then eat adequate starch to satisfy your hunger. I hope that makes sense, Amber. All right, I had one more question, but I could save it for next week if you want, Kenny. I think it's good. We're getting low on battery. Okay, well, should I do it real quick or not? So go for it. Okay, so Renee wants to know when enrollment for the Ultimate Weight Loss Program starts. Oh, this is a good one. How is it different from other programs, other plant-based programs specifically? So Renee, it's not a program that starts and stops. It's a program that star starts and, and goes on forever because we are available to you 365 days a year. So whenever you join... Almost. Well, yeah, except <laughs> pretty much. Whenever you join, within 24 hours, the program is sent to you and you're admitted into the private support group where myself and my partner, John Pierre, John Pierre, who is a nutritional guru and uh, fitness expert for, with 30 years experience, he 
and I both support you where you can ask questions and you engage with other people. We've created like a family, a tribe of other people that are going through the same things. They're in different phases of their recovery. Some are just starting out, some may have relapsed, some have lost 100, 200 pounds, and it's like one big family. And that's really the beauty of the program is the ongoing support. And of course there is supporting material like a, like a uh, 21 day recipe plan. There is multiple lectures and audios as probably 20 hours of material and you get that. So you can do that anytime. And so it's different than other plant-based programs because to my knowledge, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's the only food addiction program that is vegan, that is 100% plant-based. So there's other wonderful programs that are plant-based, even oil-free ones, but they don't really deal with food addiction or even acknowledge it. Unfortunately, many of the wonderful doctors in the plant-based movement who have always been slender themselves they uh, allow things like sugar and flour in their recipes in varying amounts, even alcohol they'll allow, because either they don't believe in food addiction or they don't acknowledge it. And like I say, they've never been overweight themselves and so maybe they just don't get it or they haven't read enough of the scientific literature to show that it is a true biogenetic disease. I believe Dr. Ifland said there's something like 6,000 articles currently in the medical journals that, uh, that address the fact that food addiction is real. We know that Dr. Joan Ifland believes it's real and Dr. Pam Peek and definitely Dr. Ellen Goldhammer. The thing is, is the food addiction treatment programs, they didn't address my needs as somebody who was an ethical vegan who wanted to be plant-based. And anytime I would check one out, I never went to meetings, but I would email or, or talk to people that were in them. They basically said that you have to eat oil and that you have to, you know, have to do the strict weighing and measuring, which I knew wasn't going to work for me. I mean, I got up at three o'clock in the morning to get on a plane. How am I going to do what they're telling me and weigh my food on an airplane? And even when I don't even know what city I'm in half the time. But the thing is, is these uh, food addiction programs that have existed for so long, which all rely on the same system of strict weighing and measuring, uh, to my knowledge, none of them really are vegan and there may be vegan people in them but they certainly don't promote it as a vegan program or as a vegan recovery program because they all insist on eating that oil or that fat and many of them say that you cannot reverse food addiction with a with a vegan diet because that starch won't do it and that's absolutely not true so for 45 years, I was, as Dr. McDougall lovingly calls, a fat vegan, and there was really no one out there to help me because, well, yes, Dr. Goldhammer and Dr. Lyle helped me, and Dr. McDougall did too, but what I mean, there was no program to help me because all the programs in the plant-based world allowed sugar and flour and alcohol sometimes, which are highly addictive foods, even in small amounts for people with our sensitive brains, and all the non-vegan programs didn't allow you to be vegan thinking you could only reverse this with with animal flesh. And so that's why I had to create my own program and as luck would have it, it did work for me and it's worked for thousands of others now. So we hope you'll consider joining us and everyone is welcome to consider joining the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. This is a difficult time of year and I know a lot of you are waiting till January 2nd. I know we're gonna see a huge enrollment, but why wait? Because the weight you gain now till the end of the year is weight that's not easily taken off. And if you haven't signed up for the eight week holiday webinar series, we've got two more left, but you get replays and they've been absolutely phenomenal. So if there's no more questions. Well, Teresa Bishop is signing up for January. Well, thank you. And uh, we can we hear one more? Can we hear absolutely, one more? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, then, again, I've seen seen incredible results from people that have taken this program. Right, as a matter of fact, and it it's was, really exciting. Kenny is the person that introduced me to Shada, who some of you know from my Facebook Lives, who has now five years kept 100 pounds off after being told you know, it, she was a hopeless case and going to have to have gastric yeah. bypass surgery, a procedure that her uncle died from. So it's, it's, a, it's amazing guys that it really, the program really does work. What, what other question did you have? That's it. That's it. All right. Well, thanks you guys for tuning in. Sorry that we started a little bit late. We'll be back next week at 2 PM Pacific time, our regular time for weight loss Wednesday. I'm chef AJ. Thank you so much for watching. If you have a question, please go to www.eatonprocess.com and submit it through our website. And I just want you to know that you really can have both the health and the body you deserve. Thanks so much for watching. And we want to say, Bailey didn't show up oh, today. We studio forgot audience to tell you that our studio audience was asleep this session. So remember, don't breed or buy while homeless animals die. Thanks guys. Take care. Good night.